Welcome to Morning Point's Virtual Caregiver Cafe series. I am Rachel Smith and I will be your host for today. Here at Morning Point Senior Living, we believe information and education move people forward. That's why we continue to open doors and connect with community leaders, medical experts, and senior living influencers. This helps seniors, families, and the future workforce better understand the challenges of aging, as well as the support and resources that are available. Our goal with each Morning Point Foundation Caregiver Cafe is to increase public awareness for senior caregiving needs and challenges, and support educational, clinical, and wellness initiatives that strengthen caregivers. We would like to thank the Morning Point Foundation for collaborating with us to make this exceptional event happen. And now I would like to introduce Audra Hopkins, Executive Director of the Morning Point Foundation. Thank you, Rachel. Hello and welcome. The Morning Point Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit public service organization that provides caregiver support programs, sponsors educational awareness events, and funds clinical scholarships to advance the care of seniors. The foundation focuses on three main components, caregiver support and training, educating a future workforce, and leading the way. The foundation collaborates with 10 schools across the Southeast. Since 2014, we provided scholarships to over 60 nursing students. I would like to thank our ongoing sponsors for our Morning Point Foundation Caregiver Cafe series. First Horizon Bank and Propel Insurance. These sponsors help us achieve our goal of supporting nursing students and providing educational programs. If you would like to donate or learn more about the foundation, please visit the Morning Point Foundation website. Thank you, Audra. During this event, we encourage you to ask questions via the chat button available in the Zoom application. The presenter will receive the questions and address them following the broadcast. You will receive an email following the event with answers to all questions submitted. Please sit back and enjoy our virtual Caregiver Cafe series. Welcome everyone to our special Morning Point Foundation Caregiver Cafe Retirement Planning Educational Presentation in partnership with Pearson Hughesman Attorneys and Morning Point Senior Living. I am Audra Hopkins, Executive Director of the Morning Point Foundation. Tonight we will cover trust and wills, long-term care, and estate planning. During tonight's presentation, you can ask questions with the chat option on your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Rachel Smith will keep track of the questions and work with Martin and John to get those answered as they come in. If you have submitted a question that is not answered, please be on the lookout for an email that will address those unanswered questions. I am delighted to introduce our presenters this evening who will be leading our discussion retirement planning. Attorney Martin Pierce is a certified estate planning specialist who has been in practice in Chattanooga for 40 years, who specializes in estate planning, elder law, probate, special needs law, and tax matters. Attorney John Huseman is a Chattanooga area native and practice here since 2004, who also specializes in estate planning, elder law, probate, and special needs law. Now with great excitement, I would like to turn the presentation over to Martin and John. Thank you, Audra. Good evening. I'm John Huseman. And I'm Martin Pierce, and we're very glad to be with you. Well, Martin, why don't we go ahead and get started talking about some estate planning. Okay. What is estate planning and why is estate planning important even if you don't think maybe that you're going to have a large estate? Well, of course, your estate is the assets that you have and everything that you have that you may leave behind when you die. And estate planning is the process that you can go through to select how those assets will be treated and dealt with and, and uh, sent on to other people and who will be in charge of that. Of course, most people think in terms of a will, but in addition to a will, you may use a trust and you definitely should use and have advanced directives like a power of attorney for finances and advanced directives for healthcare. 
Tell us a little bit more. Uh, what happens if you die without a last will? Does if you're married, does everything just go to your spouse, or how does that work? <laughs> Surprisingly, it does not all go to your spouse necessarily. If you have children, uh, you know, if you don't have a will, the state of Tennessee or the state of Georgia, if you're in Georgia or whatever state you live in, will have laws that then in effect enforce a will for you, uh, and so. For example, if you have children and you don't have a will, uh, most states, including Tennessee and Georgia, which are the closest ones around here, uh, would force the estate to go to the spouse and children, not all to the spouse. And that's usually not what people want to do. So it's definitely worth doing your estate planning and getting a will or trust or both in place. I think it's also important to remember that with a will, you get to pick the person who will be in charge of disposing of the estate. Whereas what, what is the nature of it if you don't have a will and you don't pick the person? Yeah, the, the, under a will, you're going to pick an executor to be in charge of the will and to carry things out under a trust, a trustee. If you don't have a will and the state's laws come into play, then it's... Uh, you're going to have a pecking order under the statutes of the law that are probably going to make the spouse the first choice and then children. But again, it's kind of up for grabs and you can go into court and argue over those things. And sometimes people do thinking that they're the best for the job, even though someone else has a higher priority. That sounds like that could be a real uh, mess and a difficulty. Rachel, I know that one of the things we want to do is be open to any listener questions. Uh, do we have any that have come in that we should talk about? Absolutely, John. Thank you so much. One of the first questions that's come in is very similar to what you have just been talking about. And the question is, do you need a will if you have everything titled in joint names and covered by beneficiary designations? I'll be happy to address that. We believe that it's still very important for you to have a will, even if you've heavily utilized joint ownership of property or beneficiary designations. There are several reasons for that. Uh, one of the main reasons is that with joint ownership, you're not sure, say, between yourself and your spouse, who's going to pass away first. Now, on the first spouse to pass away with the joint ownership of property, the surviving spouse will, as a matter of law, be the full and sole owner of that property. So at that juncture, when the first spouse passes, the will wouldn't necessarily be probated or used. The problem is we don't know which spouse that's going to be. And so we strongly advise preparing wills for both spouses. Then when the second spouse passes away, and we don't know when that's going to be exactly, That'll be a very important time for the disposing, uh, directing, and passing of assets. Yeah, you could die in the same accident. And a lot of times, even when you have an ill spouse and you assume they're going to die first, we've seen situations where it still turned out that in an accident or something or a stroke or a heart attack, they died in an order you didn't expect. Yeah, that's very true. With regards to beneficiary designations on things like bank accounts, 401ks, and IRAs, those are very important to use. And we strongly recommend that you use a beneficiary designation, and including with life insurance policies, of course, you know, for your spouse as a first beneficiary. Once we get past the spouse, we have to be very careful about how we use beneficiary designations. Uh, it might be tempting to list all of your children. However, again, if, if a child were to predecease you, we might not want a large amount to go to their child, to say a grandchild. We, it might be more appropriate for that to be held in a trust for a grandchild. And it might be more appropriate to just have a completely different disposition of the assets altogether. So while a spouse is an excellent first designation for both a beneficiary, pay on death, transfer on death designation, once we get past that level, we have to be very careful in using that. A will is really a better tool to use uh, after the spouse level. That's right. Uh, any, anything else, any other questions along those lines at this point? 
Yes, actually, we do have a question about wills and they're asking, does a will have to be filed at the courthouse in order for it to be valid? No, it, it doesn't. In fact, almost all jurisdictions have gotten away with gotten away from the filing of wills. And I'm talking about not probate, but filing. A lot of counties and a lot of states used to have filings. You do not have to put your will with the court. Now, after a death, for a will to become active, it must be probated. And that's proving, probate, prove, prove the will to be the last will. And so yes, for a will, uh, you can't just uh, administer it, it without going through the court to make it effective. Martin, I think that brings us to uh, an important topic that a lot of people ask about, which is what is the difference between a will and a trust? Well, again, most people are familiar with wills being your last testament, what you want, who you want to be in charge, what you want them to do with your assets. Uh, and that is something that would be probated at some point if it's a second spouse death, not the first spouse again. Uh, but a trust is an agreement or a contract where you establish uh, the person in charge again, the trustee, and you then transfer certain assets into that trust. You retitle them into the name of the trust, and then they're administered and dealt with under that trust agreement rather than a will. A trust is not probated, only a will is. So a lot of people want to use a revocable or living trust as a will substitute because it doesn't have to be probated. So there, there are ways around probate. Are there different kinds of trusts? Uh, and if so, tell us a little bit about maybe some of the more frequently used kinds of trusts. And sure. you know, what if any advantages you think there may be to a trust versus a will, if any? Yeah, there, there can definitely be uh, reasons to do a trust. I mentioned a revocable trust, which by its terms means you could revoke it, modify it, change it at any time. It's a look through thing uh, and doesn't mess up your tax planning or your tax returns. You'd still do a 1040. Then there are, a, as opposed to a revo revocable trust, there's an irrevocable trust. And as its name suggests, uh, it kind of locks down, becomes irrevocable, is not easily sus susceptible to change or modification, and may not be able to change it at all, but there may be some ways to do it. Um, so an irrevocable trust is treated as a separate legal entity and a separate taxpayer. And so it, it's as if you gave your money away to the trust and it has its own tax return, a 1041, like you and I would have a 1040. Why would you want to lock things up in an irre irrevocable trust? Well, for one thing, it renders asset protection. Uh, creditors or a divorce or something like that, they can't get through to those assets because it's irrevocable. And so it protects the assets. Uh, you might use one for Medicaid planning to start your five year look back period running so that after five years, those assets would not be pulled back into your estate and the state Medicaid would pay for your nursing home care if you ever need it. And there's lots of other reasons, um, you know, to protect a, a beneficiary that may not be good with money, you may wanna put it in irrevocable trust for their lifetime or for a long period of time to protect them and protect those funds to be there for their room and board, so to speak, so that they don't run through the money. There's lots of reasons. And there's other types of trust too, but those are the two basic types that we uh, deal with. Again, Rachel, we wanna be sensitive to any questions that may be coming up. We have quite a few coming in. Thank you, John. Um, this one is about trust. And the question is, are trusts just for a person with a large estate? No, I think that uh, it's important to sort of touch on something that Martin was just referring to in terms of Medicaid planning. 
uh, which is for nursing home or long-term care planning. I know one of the things we want to talk about tonight is that uh, retirement and long-term care planning aspect that we engage in with estate planning. So one of the things that we might do is even with an estate that you know isn't what you think of as an enormous or huge estate, we could still utilize an irrevocable trust for some or most of your assets in order to protect those assets against a potential future uh, long-term nursing home care stay. So again, we, we have different levels of facilities and different levels of care. That Medicaid-centered uh, type planning trust where we protect the assets from being viewed by Medicaid later can be very important even for, an, you know, for whatever size of state you want to be passing to your loved ones. But that doesn't necessarily apply Martin, at the more intermediary or yeah. uh, assisted living phase. Tell us about that. Well, assisted living, Medicaid will not pay for that. And so you're going to need to handle your estate affairs in another direction, another way at that point. But uh, staying on the trust topic for a second, you know, you may not want to put 5000 or $10,000 into a trust, but if you had 25,000 or 50,000 or 100,000, whatever, uh, you, you definitely might want to put it in a trust to protect the beneficiary and have some oversight, somebody that can handle the money, invest the money, dole the money out as it's needed. There's a lot of reasons that people with more modest amounts of money may need a trust or may be useful to them. It's certainly not for millionaires. That's, that's, uh, certainly a misnomer in that respect. I think it's also important to remember that in terms of one of, you know, folks usually most valuable assets, which is their home, an irrevocable trust can be a place where you protect the value of your home. Because if you do have to have a lengthy nursing home stay where you're utilizing care or Medicaid uh, type help for your stay in the nursing home, your home does n is not a accountable asset while you are in the nursing home. However, when you pass away, TenCare has a lien against the home to recover for the costs of the nursing home care that you had if TenCare paid for that. So a lot of folks think, well, my home won't keep me from being in the nursing home or my home won't keep me from being on TenCare. That's correct. It won't. However, if there's value and wealth wrapped up in your home that you'd like to pass to your children, an irrevocable trust is something to think about. Uh, and you, you want to think about that before you're applying for nursing home care, isn't that right? Oh, yes. There's the five-year look back. And, and what that means is anything that you transfer within five years of the date that you go on to Medicaid, in other words, want the state to pay for your nursing home care, anything transferred during that five years for less than full and adequate consideration, in other words, it has a gift component, is going to be pulled back in and treated as if it was never transferred. So you can't do it at the last minute. And unfortunately, we see those situations come up. So like any planning, uh, whether you're doing insurance planning or planning for your family or whatever, doing it early uh, is better. For sure. Much better. There, there are some things we can do, you know, at that last minute, but they're not nearly as beneficial to your estate and to your family as if we, compared to when we can do that planning several years in advance. Do we have any other questions, Rachel? I do. So you've talked about three types of documents or tools that we can use in estate planning between beneficiary designations, last wills, and trust. Which one takes precedence? I'll be happy to address that. So a, <clears throat> a beneficiary designation will take precedence over a will. Uh, so that gift will pass as a matter of law, as a matter of, in essence, contract uh, law. Uh, to the person who is named as the beneficiary without re any regard whatsoever as to what your will says, uh, which is, a, again, an important reason why you want to sit down 
with a well-qualified estate planner to plan those assets out and those gifts and designations out. Uh, if an asset belongs to a trust, then when you pass away, it will follow under the trust instructions as opposed to your will. So they work together. The beneficiary designations do take precedence, and that's why it's important to sit down and carefully plan that out. And how you have things titled can take precedence too. If you have thing, things titled joint with right of survivorship, that survivorship feature will kick in and be an automatic legal uh, application. So it is very important that you coordinate all of this and kind of get your arms wrapped around the whole situation. Now, Martin, one of the documents that you mentioned briefly uh, mm -hmm. is the power of attorney. Yeah. Uh, tell us what that is. Are there different kinds of powers of attorney and why is that important? Yeah. So now we're switching to advanced directives and these are uh, directions that you give through documents while you're alive in advance of the need of them. For example, it would be a power of attorney, which would usually be a durable power of attorney. It would continue to be in effect even if you became incapacitated or incompetent. Uh, usually that would be a financial power of attorney to handle your business and financial affairs. But there are also health care powers of attorney to deal with your medical uh, decision making. So in the financial power of attorney, you're naming somebody to handle those affairs if you become unable to do so or if you just need help doing those things. A med medical power of attorney or a medical agent, you're naming somebody to make medical decisions for you if you're unable to make them for yourself. And then a, another document that goes along with the medical agent or medical power of attorney is a living will. And that's one that just merely gives directions to that agent or that healthcare power of attorney as to the type of care you want and includes the proverbial pull the plug uh, type thing that people are so familiar with these days if you want to give those kind of directions. So in terms of the importance of those documents, um, if uh, someone becomes incapacitated, uh, why are those documents so important? What, what are the other options out there at that point? Yeah, that's, that's the big thing. You want to go ahead and have these documents there. A lot of times I'll say a, a financial power of attorney is as important as your will because if you need it, uh, your alternative, if you don't have a power of attorney in place and somebody already named to pick up that ball and take care of paying your expenses and handling your investments and handling your affairs is to go to court and get a conservatorship or a guardianship. Those are really the same thing. Some states tend to call them conservatorships, some guardianships, uh, but you don't want to have to go to court and spend a lot of time, effort and money and pay a bunch of attorneys, to be honest with you, to uh, get a conservatorship or guardianship. And that's what you have to do if you don't have a power of attorney in place. Uh, we, we really don't like that situation. So, Yeah, it, and with the, the excellence that we have with care and the extended lifetimes uh, and sometimes need for medical treatment that we have, the, the need and the use for you know, all of those powers of attorney, that could be extensive. Yeah, it really can. I mean, it, you can use them. I mean, if you were out of the country on a trip for a month or two, uh, something could come up and somebody might need to do something or say you're in an accident and you're laid up in the hospital for four to six months. It's not something that just kicks into place and is there forever. It can come and go as needed. Uh, but if you had something like Alzheimer's or you had a stroke and you became incapacitated, it could be there for the rest of your life. But the point is to have it there as a standby and have it ready. So what are some of uh, the most common mistakes that we see? Uh, we've talked about the importance of utilizing an estate planning professional. There are some things that where folks do it on their own that work out fine. 
uh, but we've we've seen some things that really backfired. Uh, what are some things that come to mind? Wow, <laughs> there are there are so many, and and you know everybody's situation is unique and different, mm. and the the circumstances are different. But uh, yeah, we've seen some where they tried to do their own wills or do their own beneficiary designations without any help and without coordination. And uh, we've seen situations where, for example, one fellow was a school teacher. He went to the library. He did some studying about estate planning and uh, he thought he had everything the way he wanted it. He left the beneficiary designations on his life insurance and his retirement funds which together were the bulk of his estate, other than his house, to his children. Well, his children were minors, and so he died unexpectedly. And what happens is minors cannot receive more than a very small amount of money under the law. And what happened is uh, his ex-wife, the mother of those children, the guardian of those children, ended up getting those monies in her hands, which was the last place he really wanted it to go under his circumstances, because she was the guardian of the children. So we've seen some major catastrophes with trying to do self planning and uh, not seeking out professional help. Uh, you know, we just see uh, you may have some other stories. I, I yeah. don't want to take all the time. I know one of the common things to think about is real estate. Mm. Maybe with my home or some property, if I put it in my child's name, that'll yeah. be a great way during life to go ahead and engage in that planning. Uh, there's several components to that that could backfire. Yeah. Um, we've seen it backfire where it's deeded to the child and then the child passes away before the parent. And so now we have a piece of property that is really going in a direction that wasn't intended uh, at the point in time of that gift. I think we've also seen where putting uh, large gifts into the name of a child, including real estate, affects how that child is dealing with their children. That could involve college planning. It could involve applying for scholarships and filling out the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. You have to list all your assets on that form. And if mom and dad's house is on there and you don't live in it, uh, that becomes a major asset that is impacting the appearance of your net worth, uh, even though that's not what was intended. And then uh, we still have a current real tax uh, potential for there to be a real tax mistake with deeding over to a child's name. Why don't you tell us about that, Martin? Well, that's stepped up basis at death. Uh, right now and for many, many years, we have had what's called stepped up basis, which means when a person dies, the value of the assets going to the beneficiaries, to the heirs, is the value at date of death. It jumps up, it steps up to the date of death value. And so if they turn right around and sell the house, then there's no gain. And so that's a great benefit. But if you go ahead and gift the house during your lifetime, then it's carryover basis. And your child would have the, the what you spent for the property maybe 30, 40 years ago. And if they go to sell it, they're gonna have all that gain for all that 30 or 40 years, a big income tax or capital gains mistake. And let me say one other thing about this real estate, because we see so many people think, I need to put my child on there, or I need to go ahead and give it to them, or put them on joint. You are putting the, and this also applies to bank accounts, checking accounts, I need to put them on there. No, use a power of attorney as the way that your, your uh, agent under your power of attorney can access your account without it becoming their account. If you put them on joint with the house or joint with the bank account, they are co-owners. So then their creditors can come after that asset. Mm. Their divorce, that asset is in their estate and their, whoever they're divorcing can come after those assets. We see some big, big mistakes that people, you know, think they've done the right thing. I, I call it, you know, a rifle shot 
when a when it's really a shotgun approach they they see a problem and they say this will correct it but they're not seeing the big picture the big spread of the of what could happen all these other things that could happen yeah it may have worked for that one thing but boy it brought all this other baggage on with it so uh, yeah Rachel we want to be uh, sensitive and leave some time for listener questions Absolutely. Thank you. You were just speaking of power of attorney. And one of the questions is, who should you appoint as a power of attorney or an executor of your will? And do they need to live in the same state as you? Yeah. So yeah, either one of us can. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, what we come back to time and time again with our practice and nominating these agents, mm -hmm. because these are persons who will act on your behalf as an agent, the number one criteria is that there's someone that you can trust. And there's someone who uh, will act consistent with your wishes and who know you well. They don't need to be an accounting expert. They can get accounting assistance and advice if they need it. They don't need to be a legal expert. They can get legal assistance and advice if they need it. They don't need to be a medical expert. They can consult with medical experts, at, you know, if and when that's necessary with a healthcare power of attorney. The most important thing is that there's someone who you trust and who will understand and honor your wishes and your needs above everything else. Um, and then, the, yeah, the next thing would be good judgment. Are they good at handling the affairs that you're asking them to handle? A lot of these positions, power of attorney, executor, trustee, deal with money or finances or property. Are they good at handling finances, at handling investments or going and getting the help they need? Do they have good judgment, a level head on their shoulders, common sense? Uh, if it's medical, you know, do you have a child who's in the medical profession who might understand the lingo better that, that they would have to deal with? And if not, who would be able to handle uh, medical questions and handle the burden, the emotional burden of handling medical questions. So, yeah, it, the, you know, the first thing is exactly what John is saying, trustworthiness, who is going to follow through and do the right thing. But then you need to think about what they're doing and think about uh, their judgment and uh, common sense. If those two things are wrapped up, that really, you know, takes care of most other issues. It is worth thinking about in that decision making chain uh, whether or not it would be wise to set someone up that might have some sort of financial conflict or a financial difficulty in their life that might create a conflict by having access to the assets or funds of another person. I don't put that at the top. But it is one of the criteria that you might think about. One of the aspects of that question was whether or not you can appoint the same person to serve in both of these capacities. And the answer to that is yes. You can appoint the same person to be your uh, power of attorney or attorney in fact. Those are the, the, the same concept or the same document. And then as well as your executor. It's important to note that the attorney, power of attorney is effective while you're alive and the power of attorney powers vanish when you pass away at that moment, at that instant. Whereas a will only takes effect, if at all, upon your death. You know, it's, it's revocable or changeable up to the moment of your death. And so then the, the time period for service of an, a, a power of attorney and an executor are consecutive. They're not concurrent. They don't overlap. Uh, so your power of attorney and your executor's duties won't overlap. That highlights that they don't need to be the same person at all, uh, but they can be the same person without any serious uh, or obvious conflict. Yep, that's true. Are there any other questions? There are. Uh, speaking of power of attorneys, what kind of provisions should someone consider when they're having a power of attorney developed for them? Yeah, um, you know, and, and reading between the lines on that, um, you know, that has a, been a really fast growing area. Uh, powers of attorney interface with financial institutions a lot of times, 
and the laws have changed in that area and privacy concerns and all of that. And it, there's a lot of provisions there. When I first started practicing law 40 years ago, you know, there may have been eight or 10 uh, subsections in a power of attorney. We now have 34 sections in a power of attorney, and I've seen them with 50 and 60 sections in them. So there's really a whole lot of different things that could go into a power of attorney. It needs to, you know, we sometimes joke about it covers the kitchen sink. Uh, you know, it, it covers everything. It covers uh, bank accounts and uh, tax returns and real estate and just a lot, a lot, a lot of things. But there's a lot of things that you wouldn't think of. And, you know, again, where I was starting when I said reading between the lines, if you go online and try to find a power of attorney, you're not going to know if it's a good one or not. Um, and just because it has 50 sections doesn't necessarily mean it's good. I've seen them with many sections that are not well drafted, and not good. That So if you're doing a will, a trust, or a power of attorney, I would definitely get the professional help and, and uh, get an attorney. If you're doing healthcare directives in any state, you can probably get those free online because there's a standard form for the state. So we do that as a part of our estate planning, but we really don't charge for that. We're just doing it because we want to, again, cover the waterfront and get all the documents in place. But so you, you can go on your state um, website and look for uh, a healthcare surrogate or power of a healthcare power of attorney or healthcare agent. They call it different things in different states. And you can probably find that form for free. That's, I'm not trying to avoid and say you need an attorney every time for everything. But for a lot of these things that we're talking about, you really do. Uh, and the one last thing I want to say about the health care is every state is different. There are no two states in the United States that use the same health care forms, advanced directives. That sounds funny. That's weird. But it is the truth. So you need to make sure you get your state's forms and the most current forms. Tennessee, where we are, and we're right on the Georgia line, so we do Georgia. Tennessee has been through four different sets of health care forms in the last 25 years. So, I think one of the more serious topics that we run into in our practice involves uh, elder abuse, including financial elder abuse by those who are their nominated agents or other family members who take advantage of and utilize the power of attorney uh, in ways that, you know, benefit the, the power of attorney as opposed to benefiting you. One of the ways they can do that is if the provisions in the power of attorney with regards to making of gifts, with regards to the taking of funds for the personal use of the power of attorney, with regards to making changes to insurance policies or bank accounts, um, you know, it's one thing to be able to access the funds in a bank account for another person. It's another thing to be able to, say, change the beneficiary designation on a bank account. Uh, that is a way where a person could make a major estate planning change uh, against someone's wishes. And so that's where the trust comes in. But that's also where utilizing, uh, you know, uh, an attorney or other trusted person, you can evaluate the form to determine, does this have some of the protections that I need or that I should consider? It's also going to be a format or a place where you can discuss <clears throat> what are the accountability provisions that should exist with regards to this person so that I can be smart about not setting myself up uh, for elder abuse? I think one of the times we see that most is with maybe uh, a self-performed uh, form and uh, somebody downloads it, sticks it under grandma's hand, says, here, sign this, uh, and then they're, they're sort of off and running. Um, we can't, pre we can't prevent all of those things uh, here in our office. At the same time, we want to educate people about what to look for and things to consider 
uh, so that you're utilizing careful planning uh, with regards to all of these issues. Yeah, and, and the way we draft those documents and the protections we put into those documents help with those things too. So we do put provisions in there to help with that. But we're seeing in the last 15 years or so just an enormous uh, increase in people taking advantage of other people. Martin, how does estate planning connect with retirement planning and long-term care planning? What We've touched on that a little bit with trusts, but uh, there's more to it than that, isn't there? Well, obviously, retirement plans themselves and IRAs are a big part of people's estate plans. But again, we have talked about Medicaid and the fact that you would need to, your estate planning documents would need to uh, work together toward maybe the five year look back, starting that clock running so that you can get on to Medicaid and qualify for it and not have them come back and, and say, well, all these things that you did within the last five years have to be brought back. Um, what else are you thinking of on that? Well, in terms of uh, assisted living type facilities and thinking about how a person might be planning to uh, pay for that, mm -hmm. uh, how they might see that, uh, you know, what are their options? Do they do they have, I guess they've got some live at home options. There's assisted living options and excellent facilities like Morning Point. And then what are some of the financial considerations for that or ways that they could help with that? Yeah. Um go ahead with that that's fine I, you've yeah. got an idea there so i'm gonna let you run with it well i mean i think it's definitely important to consult uh with your financial planner about allocating mm -hmm. assets uh wisely in terms of whether or not there's an insurance product that might help you uh, with an assisted living type facility as well as your uh, with your iras and your 401ks there's different things you can do with your distributions yeah uh, you might do something different with your distribution schedule, uh, with your tax planning, uh, in order to be able to afford uh, and plan for the, the facility uh, of your choice. That will involve a number of factors, including your family situation, uh, your desires for where you want to be. Do you want to be in your home? Do you want to be in your hometown? Do you need to be re relocating? Uh, to maybe where a child is? Are you going to think about a, a facility in that area? Do you want to explore um, what it takes to live in your home? Uh, and what are the financial vehicles uh, that you can get into to, to help you achieve those goals? So uh, it, I think it's important to note again, some folks think that, well, with assisted living, that's where, you know, Medicare will pay for that. Does Medicare pay for assisted living? Uh, not on a very short term basis. The basic answer is no, but the technical answer is for a short period of time after certain hospital stays. Yeah, for I think about 100 days it will yeah. after. Otherwise, with uh, assisted living, uh, does does TennCare pay for assisted living? Uh, no, it does not. It, it, it only pays for skilled nursing care, which is medically required care. So it's important, you know, along with your estate planning that you're considering, okay, how are we going to pay for okay. assisted living? Because the, the governmental programs, Medicare doesn't pay for that. Uh, not, not part A or not part B, except for maybe the 100 days. Or D or any, yeah, any of them. And it, yeah, exactly. And Medicaid's only going to pay when you run out of money. And then insurance is another option or savings, your own savings, which would include include IRAs. Rachel, do you have some other questions for us? I do. We have some long-term care questions coming in. And one is, is long-term care insurance necessary? Who should consider getting this? And at what age would they take this into consideration? Well, it's certainly not necessary. I, I met with a couple today and they were wanting to do Medicaid planning. They were talking about making some transfers and starting the five years running. And the more we talked about it in this particular case, the couple had enough funds to pay for whatever came up, which most of us don't have that, but they did. And so we ended up saying, let's not try to 
to put your assets uh, away somewhere and start the five years running. But, um, you know, you don't have to have insurance, but it's a good thing to look at because it's leveraging. It's like any insurance. You don't know if you're going to have the need or not, but you can pay lesser amounts now when you're younger and have that insurance in case you need it. So when do you start looking at it? Well, you could start looking at it in your 30s or 40s, and it really wouldn't hurt to do that. But most people look at it in about their late 40s to their 50s. And, and frankly, by the time you're in your early 60s, you're really getting too late uh, in a lot of cases. You don't have to have insurance to pay for long-term care, but it's a good thing to check out. And it, your employer may have a program that will assist in paying for it, kind of like your 401k. They may have kind of a matching type program for long-term care insurance, and you, you should look at that. I think one of the important things is that uh, the insurance products that might help with assisted living today are not uh, the same all or nothing type insurance sure. policies that were issued in the past. They're generally life insurance based policies where if you utilize the funds for assisted living, uh, that's fine. But if you don't, there is a residual benefit that you know is a way to to grow uh, your money and to have an upside even if you pass away without using assisted living at all or maybe you just use it a little bit it's not a very expensive policy that you might not use at all uh, that was a risk with some of the prior policies uh, the current policies tend to avoid that where even if you gain no massive benefit from a long-term care type policy, at least you're not losing anything. Yeah, you get a death benefit. You get a life insurance payout to your children or grandchildren. So it's like he says, it's uh, the more you use it for long-term care, the less the, the death benefit will be and vice versa. So yeah, it's, they're definitely more flexible, better products now than there used to be. And you can plan with those late, but the earlier that you do consider those and plan with them, the better uh, sorts of return that you get on your dollar, both for long-term care dollars as well as for life insurance dollars and the, the sliding scale on that in terms of usage for long-term care versus what your eventual uh, death benefit payout would be. Excellent. I'm going to change gears on us just a little bit. We've had a few people join us in the middle of the presentation and I'd love to get to their questions and circle back to some things we talked about early on. One person is asking, can you explain what it means for an estate to go into probate? What's the process like? What can that entail? What are the pitfalls of that happening? Sure, I'll start that off. And yeah, I'm go sure ahead. Martin will have something to add. The process for when an estate goes into probate is that the person who's named as the executor in the will uh, takes the original will, uh, you know, generally hires an attorney to have them prepare a petition, and that petition is filed in the probate section of Chancery Court uh, in Tennessee. Is or how that probate works. court, wherever, yeah. Yeah, it's filed in the probate court. And so to probate literally means to prove. And so what you're doing is you're proving that that will is the last will. And once the uh, will is accepted for probate uh, by the court, the executor is issued what we call letters, letters testamentary. And those letters testamentary are what the executor takes and they take them to the bank and they say, I represent the estate. You can turn the bank account over to me. They might consult with a, a real estate person and they will use that document as part of the real estate transaction for their authority to sell the house, if that's appropriate. They will use that document, which gives them the right to sell the personal property, if that's the appropriate way to do it, or to otherwise distribute the assets. So the process is you file a petition, you receive your letters testamentary, notice is given to your creditors, and while that's taking place, the executor collects all the assets. They can liquidate and sell assets where that's appropriate and stick them into a bank account. 
They can otherwise corral and assemble the liquid cash assets into a single estate bank account. And they can make a plans for what they're going to do with non-liquid assets such as real estate or vehicles. When all of the creditors have been notified and any debts or expenses have been paid, I say have been paid, it's the executor's duty to retain enough cash to pay off any debts that may exist. If there are no debts, they will then distribute the funds according to the instructions in the will. And so if that means distributing money, they'll take their estate checking account book, they'll write a check, and they'll send it off and get a receipt. And then there's some final closing paperwork that needs to be done as well. In Hamilton so, County, <coughs> yeah. how, how do we tell? Well, uh, yeah, let me go to a different thing because that question, the way it was asked, um, you know, it implies that probate may be a bad thing or there's bad things about it. And, you know, the general answer to that is it's not a bad thing. And let me explain that because th there's two things. So if you live in California, uh, everybody does a revocable living trust in California instead of a will because they want to avoid probate. Why? Because California, its probate cost, its probate fees are a percentage of your estate. And that, in other words, California has decided they're gonna take another big chunk out of your estate at your death. So, okay, if you live in California, there is something bad about probate. You do want to avoid it. You do definitely wanna use a revocable trust. In most states in the United States, and there's a few others like California, but not many, but most states, probate is not that big a deal. Here's the thing I want to tell you, and this is where this makes all the difference in the world. If you do no planning, you have no will, you've done nothing, you don't have a trust, you've done no planning, and somebody dies and they have a house and bank accounts and assets and IRAs, and you have to now administer that estate where do you administer that estate? In the probate court. You've not told who's gonna be the executor, you've not told who's gonna get what, when, how, who, or where, but yet it has to go through probate court and it is a free-for-all. Everybody in the family who thinks they're the best person to do it, or they're the ones who ought to get everything, and let me tell you, people rationalize like crazy as to why they ought to get more or get all, but anyway, you're going to probate court, but there's been no planning. And that's where pro probate gets a bad name. It wasn't probate at all. There wasn't a will. And, but it goes to probate court. And there's where the, you get the long drawn out fights. If you actually have a will and have gotten your ducks in a row and have done your planning and you probate that will, it goes very smoothly. You've already said, this I is dotted, this T is crossed, everything is going to be handled a certain way, and it's just a matter of a few months, and most of that time you're just waiting for a creditor's period to run, and it, it doesn't cost much money uh, in the sense of probate court cost or just a few hundred dollars in most states, unlike California, where it is a percentage of the estate. So, you know, there's just a real lack of understanding about probate that you're going to probate court when you don't have a will and it's a mess. And if you have the will, it's not a mess. It's it just, uh, you know, you, things get names and things get tainted and it just isn't that way. Great. Thank you so much. It looks like we are almost out of time. So I'd love if we could ask you one more question and then close out for the night. Um, what other kinds of professionals, in addition to attorneys such as yourself, should a person consider when planning for retirement and looking into estate planning? Yeah, I think uh, one of the most important folks that can assist you is a uh, financial planner. 
Uh, and it really is important to uh, coordinate uh, with your uh, attorneys for estate planning as well as your financial planner. One of the things we've talked about tonight is insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, financial planners help you source your insurance as well as make other plans for how you're going to handle your assets. Uh, An and accountant for understanding the tax uh, consequences and aspects for mm -hmm. your estate would also be important. And, and I would highlight that uh, in the current, <clears throat> the current status that we have, we're looking and anticipating potential changes to the tax laws that will have significant estate planning consequences. Uh, and so coordinating with a qualified accountant, a financial planner, and, a, and an attorney uh, at, at some point, not always simultaneously, uh, but, you know, throughout the process and working together. Yeah, we work as a team with these other professionals. We're all working together within our spheres of, of understanding and we coordinate things to pull it all together for your benefit. Yep. I think those are the most important ones. So we'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Rachel and Audra. Thank you so much for allowing us to join you this evening and to be a resource to the Morning Point Foundation as well as the Caregiver Cafe. Uh, we've really enjoyed it and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, we definitely love in educating people and, and sharing information with them. So we've uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Martin and John. Very informative and a much needed conversation. Thank you everyone for attending our virtual Caregiver Cafe with attorneys Martin Pierce and John Huseman. Again, if we didn't get to your questions in the chat, we will email you back a response shortly. Here's the contact information if you have further questions for Martin and John. And if you wanna reach me or have questions about the work of the Morning Point Foundation or Morning Point Senior Living, here's how you can contact us. If you have suggestions for a future Caregiver Cafe seminar, we would love to hear your ideas. Once again, thank you for Morning Point and the Morning Point Foundation. Have a great night. We hope you enjoyed this Caregiver Cafe brought to you by the Morning Point Foundation. Please join us for future Caregiver Cafes as we continue discussions around senior care, aging, and the nursing workforce. Thank you for joining us. For more information, please visit our website or get in contact with a local Morning Point associate.